when you think about Asian Americans, they're becoming more and more of a political force. And, and I would just say there's two sort of developments to them. One is that when you look at it over time, both these communities, Latinos and Asian Americans, have gravitated strongly towards the Democratic Party. Whereas now, in any given presidential year, you'll see more than 75% Latinos and Asian Americans vote for the Democratic Party. And, and I think this is sometimes obscure because when you ask Asian American voters, like, what's most important to you? They're gonna talk about schools or you know, jobs or things like that. But it is not a doubt in my mind that the direction of the Republican Party is becoming so, basically the Republican Party right now is becoming a white nationalist party. And so you're seeing this direction of Latinos and Asian Americans gravitating towards the Democratic Party. And I think that's an important development. I mean, my parents were Reagan Republicans. And now, if I, I, I can't say, not that I ever would, but I can't say anything good about Donald Trump, not that I ever would, um, 
but my parents are so much, they wouldn't even think about voting for anybody on the Republican line. So I think that's a serious, important, long-term development that is important to note. I think the second thing that I would note politically is that, what, especially when you're talking about immigrants, is that right now, the two largest sending countries to the United States, it's not Mexico, it's not Honduras or, or Venezuela, despite what the administration might have you think. It's India and China. And so the nature of the immigrant <coughs> population in the United States is changing before our very eyes. And I, I, honestly, the immigrant rights movement is, has been really slow to take up on that. And so when you look at the immigrant rights movement as a whole, it, it, it really is not paying attention to some of these new emerging immigrant communities that a couple years from now will be the majority of immigrants in the United States. And so that's where I think you see, and if we, as the immigrant rights movement, are not engaging those people, somebody will. The vacuum will be filled. And right now, when you look at it, that vacuum is being filled by some of these right-wing conservative types that have organized around things like data, fighting data disaggregation in Massachusetts. They've turned out hundreds of people. Or in Maryland or Virginia, fighting against sanctuary cities. This is ridiculous. But if we don't do a better job of engaging some of those recent immigrants who are coming in, who are becoming citizens, who are becoming the majority of the immigrant population in the United States, then other folks will, and they're going to organize them for things that we don't want them to organize for, to be totally frank. So I feel like those are some sort of longer-term political developments in thinking about the Asian American vote that we need to be cognizant of. Maybe I can jump in. Um, it's always great to be with this cast of characters. Um, there are a lot of old friends in the room from my days back at the New York Immigration Coalition 20 years ago. Um, so, so I think yes, and um, I think there's a few different other developments that are really important. Um, so APIs in general, um, and South Asians in particular, are not just um, the most rapidly growing and second most rapidly growing demographic group in the US but they're growing in new and interesting places, right? So they're going outside the typical gateway regions that are New York and California. They're going in places like Northern Florida, like Alabama, like Georgia, like Texas, um, and some places in between. And so, and that's been happening for the last 15 years. And so at the same time that you see a white supremacist agenda that is increasingly being articulated and advanced, really at every step of the way by this administration, you have an opportunity for engagement on the part of South Asian Americans, some of whom are the most vulnerable, right? So at the same time that we have any number of undocumented folks, in particular from AAPI communities, you have almost half a million, at least 450,000 undocumented Indians in this country alone. And what we are now seeing in the most recent wave of detainees that are really existing at the nexus of a national security system and an anti-immigrant agenda are folks from uh, Pakistan, from Bangladesh, and from Nepal. So um, what does that mean for civic engagement, right? That means that it can't just be electoral engagement for our communities. There has got to be the work of organizations like Make the Road and many others, including our community partners um, in New York, ranging from Saki to Chaya to Adhikar, um, to uh, Sapna NYC, who are organizing and mobilizing grassroots South Asians before they are actually able to vote. Um, and that means that South Asians and Korean Americans in particular in this most recent election are flipping districts, right? So the first district on Tuesday to flip was Barbara Comstock's district in Virginia, the 10th district in Virginia. Barbara Comstock has been an incumbent for the last 15 years, who so every chance she can get equates the work of Mara Salva Trucha with an immigrant community. She has refused to meet with folks from Nakasek in his district. Um, she has capitalized on the wedge politics, and guess what? She went down yeah. <laughs> on Tuesday night um, because she refused to meet with the community and because her opponent took advantage of her being totally out of step with her suburban Virginia district that increasingly feels threatened, as well they should, by the anti-immigrant policies and rhetoric of this administration. So that opportunity really rests upon us to transform and transcend the wedge politics that in particular, the current iteration of the GOP are advancing from affirmative action, to the citizenship question on the census, to data disaggregation, they are doing our, their very best to 
divide and separate API communities from Latino communities, even though we are disproportionately impacted by all the same issues, ranging from immigration enforcement to the reduction of asylum to uh, you know challenge to public benefits access, right? Um, and so I think it's really our work on the ground to continue educating our communities to do not believe the hype. Um, because that is what is going to be transformational to the future that we can all build together in this country. I would just add, and, and thank you so much to Afi for having us here, your great partners and all of my colleagues. I couldn't agree more with what, what uh, was said so far. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there was great success this week, right? Our members um, at Make the Road New York, you know, we're an immigrant advocacy organization. We do work across various issues. And the last couple of years uh, have been very difficult ones, right, for our community members, as they have been for, for many of us. Um, what we saw on, 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 on Tuesday was really uh, the result of what many uh, what folks at Make the Road, what many of the folks in the room have done every single day for many, many years. Knocking on doors, having conversations with people about the issues that matter. Uh, at Make the Road, we, we knocked on uh, 20,000 doors, contacted 20,000 people in this in this latest round. And what, what came out of that were amazing conversations about, about issues and how those issues connect to our electoral process. Uh, you know, and, and you don't need to look farther than, than Long Island as an example, right? Where the demographics of Long Island um, have long been trending towards communities of color, uh, but the leadership there has not reflected that. Uh, what we saw was, you know, as, as some examples, Monica <coughs> Martinez uh, uh, winning a seat um, in, in the state senate uh, here in New York. Kevin Thomas, an Indian, Indian American, beating a 28-year senator, Ken Hannon. Uh, Anna Kaplan, an Iranian American, uh, beating out um, a Republican uh, incumbent. So, so we're making progress. What our members know is that while this week has been great on the electoral front, that we're not done. Right. We have to continue fighting. We have to continue talking to people, having those one-on-ones, um, and you know, capitalizing. I know we're going to talk about the role of technology, but really, uh, also going back to basics every single day and having conversations with folks uh, about the changes we want to see and how you you achieve those changes. Well, Sue, I wanted to invite you to see if you would like to participate in this um, from your perspective, maybe um, as a journalist, in terms of how the midterm elections and their results were covered, perhaps from an Asian American perspective, the extent to which these stories um, and this level of engagement is even reflected in mainstream media, um, and whether you have any other opinions. Sure. Um, it's really terrific to be here. I'm very inspired by the work that is already being done and sort of will continue to, to be done. Um, I just want to sort of echo something that Stephen said at the top, which is that one of the challenges, not just um, Journalists has been these, this question of the vacuum, and the the fact of the matter is that there's just so many more vacuums constantly opening up, right? And so um, I think as a reporter, as an academic, as people who are tasked with finding narratives or finding coherence, it's just increasingly difficult to do that. And so I think that's why um, when you talk about something like like WeChat in the Chinese speaking community, um, a lot of my colleagues just had no idea what that was, even though this is you know, a huge force, right? Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of other things we get into around sort of the first scene newsroom, things like that, but I think that there are just a lot of conversations happening in, in the shadows, sort of not, not um, the, the old adage that all politics is local, right? That your local politician is tasked with fixing roads, filling potholes. I mean, all politics now is just this confused mishmash of local and national and global, right? So I think we see in a lot of immigrant communities, particularly where ethnic media and um, sort of ethnic outlets um, for knowledge dissemination, a lot of those lines are getting blurred and, and there's just a lot of arguments, like the data segregationist thing, where it doesn't make sense to me how this became such a hot issue, except for the fact that it's a proxy for so I think it's just difficult for me as a journalist and academic to account for all of these changes except for the fact that um, technology sometimes can be an argument. 
Um, Sue, I wanted to come to you, back to you, because you touched on, and all of you did in some ways, right, about the importance of um, education. I mean, you could expand on your role as an organization in launching a voter education campaign this year. And as I understand it, it was all educating South Asian communities, but also educating elected officials about the issues that are relevant um, to your communities. And so I'm curious if you can talk about, like, at what point uh, or what's your observation of how effective that's been in key districts um, in your campaign efforts and what you've learned from that in terms of how that might inform your work moving forward? Yeah, well, I think it's, it has to inform our work moving forward, right? I think that we um, developed the idea of a voter guide. I want to emphasize voter guide, not scorecard, um, <clears throat> as a means not just for educating and engaging our communities right now, but to insist upon political accountability. Um, after they're elected or through the entirety of next year. Um, we knew that um, given the way that in particular house races were trending, uh, that South Asians would be critical constituents. And I wanna emphasize that our voter guide doesn't, um, for the most part, actually look at South Asian candidates. Uh, we looked at, uh, based on the data that we have, um, the top 20 congressional districts where South Asian constituents um, are at the top, right? Um, so for us, we felt it was important, particularly given all of the um, energy, um, real or otherwise, around Hindus for Trump, the ways that the affirmative action conversation in California has been going, um, the ways that so many, um, uh, the ways that in particular conservative forces are aiming to um, really capitalize on some of the divisions in South Asian American communities, we felt it was important for us to educate and engage our communities on the issues, right? Um, and so for us, it was really important for us to, particularly for incumbents, um, to make them put their money where their mouth is, right? So we didn't give someone a check mark, let's say, when they're talking about opposition to the Muslim ban, if they just said, hey, I'm opposed to the Muslim ban. We said, there's a piece of bicameral legislation that would cut off funding to implement the Muslim ban in both houses. Are you in support of this legislation? Have you signed on as a co-sponsor? Have you joined a Dear Colleague letter? So I think for our communities, for API communities and for South Asian American communities, this whole idea of demanding accountability from elected officials is a new muscle that needs to be flexed, right? For so many of our communities, you know, particularly um, in Asia, politics is corrupt and transactional, right? Um, and there's never, it's rarely a two-way street where, you know, let's say a donor or a supporter says to a particular aspiring elected official, hey, will you take the stance on the right issues? And there's often not an opportunity to loop back and to say, hey, you said you would take a good stance on A, B, and C a year ago. Where are you now? And I think that is why, for so many reasons, particularly when it comes to electoral politics, but also organizing, our communities aren't always taken as seriously by elected officials and appointed officials because we don't actually have that loop back mechanism. Right. And Uncle and Auntie writes a check to Hillary Clinton, gets a photo taken with her at a, you know, candidate forum on Staten Island or a political fundraiser on Staten Island, and then get them us, done, right? There's never a loop back mechanism. And so that political um, you know, uh, individual who is a political individual, there's like, they're done. That was a blank check written to me. Um, and so I think that that loop back mechanism with respect to political accountability is what we at SALT in particular, working in conjunction with our community partners, feel is really critical. We have more than 20 community partners um, in New York City, and I know that on the local level, particularly at the city council level and at the state senate level, that many of those folks feel like they have far deeper relationships, right? But our, our job is to bridge the real groundwork that's being done in New York City, where we as immigrant communities are forced to be reckoned with, and to ensure that those people remember us in Congress when they're elected five years later, or that they see us again at a candidate forum. And so for us, I think, you know, our voter guide was an opportunity for us to be super concrete, for us to get people on the record, and for us to put, frankly, them on notice. Um, that we and our communities would be watching them and that we'd be as specific as possible. You know, every time we did a meeting on the Hill, right, about the issues, yes, you do a meeting with a member or their staffer, and yes, you'd be talking to them about the citizenship question or about the Muslim ban or about, you know, the, the lack of a need for interior immigration enforcement. But the minute we told them we were doing a voter guide, that's when they started taking so I think that piece around um, being really concrete and making them know that we are putting them on notice is critical. And, and I just want to totally echo that because right now the Asian American community is playing politics 1.0. Right. 
we need to get to 2.0. And what 2.0 means, we need to get more sophisticated about issues and about accountability. You know, I can't tell you, I think a lot of the Asian American community is still around ethnicity and less around issues. They say, gotta get the first Chinese person, or gotta get the first Indian person elected. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That runs short real quick when you have two Chinese candidates. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who are you gonna pick then? <laughs> right? We're too Indian. So we gotta get past that piece. I mean, I totally recognize that it's important to have someone who reflects your community and, and looks like you. I, they're totally. But we gotta get to 2.0, which is about issues and less about that ethnicity. And I think the accountability piece is absolutely critical. And so, you know, um, I'll talk to a lot of folks who want to make a donation or, or thinking about holding a fundraiser. And I always say, what's your ask? Mm -hmm. What is your ask? And then they kind of look at me and I say, your ask better not be take a picture with me. <laughs> because you have real leverage, mm -hmm. right? I remember in 2016, you know, we had a 501c4. This is really when the light turned on for me. You know, we had, uh, the New York Immigration Coalition is a 501c3, we're an $8 million organization, blah, 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 we have offices. We have a 501c4, the 26, a 501c4 is basically an organization that's a nonprofit, but it can make endorsements. Um, but donations to it are not tax deductible, but it's a powerful political force. And I remember in the New York State presidential primary, it was locked tight. It was Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. We went to Hillary Clinton and said, Hillary, you know, uh, we have the 501c3, but through our 501c4, we want to endorse you. And here are our asks. We want you to promise to create a new <coughs> National Office of Immigrant Affairs. And we want you to you know, do a fundraiser for us. And we want you to promise to <coughs> put in like $10 million into immigration legal services. And it was like that moment in Austin Powers where she was like, $10 million, come on. And we were like, oh, we want $10 billion. She was like, not too late. Um, but she agreed to it. And we said, we want you to come to a community round table and announce these, and she agreed to it. And I was like, wow. Like, this is amazing. Our 51C4 has such little presence, but the fact that we put an ask in front of her in exchange for something that she wanted changed the ball game. I mean, it almost got totally derailed because one of her staff called me and was like, you guys don't even have a functioning website. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, no, it's, don't worry, it's up. And I'm like, get the website up. But in the middle of campaign season, she came, did a community round table for us. We had 15 people there. She announced to like the entire national media that she was making these commitments. It was eye-opening. So I'll talk to people now. You know, there's this group of Asian American like wealthy donors, and they put a lot of money on the table. And I always ask them, what's your ask, right? If you're gonna put together $50,000 or $100,000 for Governor Cuomo or Mayor de Blasio, you better have an ask. And believe me, they will listen to you, right? And, and that's just what I would say. We need to be better about asks, we need to be better about asks about our issues that are connected to our community. That is playing politics 2.0, and that's what we need to get. Can I just, uh, so uh, the 1.02, and I think, I think you really perfectly articulate some of the, the um, I don't know, sort of gaps that I noticed as I was reporting this piece on affirmative action, because you know I was talking to a lot of very conservative leaning sort of what they call sort of the Chinese Tea Party folks, and you know they were telling me about some of the folks that they had. Um, campaign against, and one, one was like a Chinese American politician, I asked this guy who was Chinese, was that weird to campaign against a Chinese guy? And he looked at me like I was insane. He said, why would I support him just because he was Chinese? And what was interesting about their their strategy was that, whereas I think it's very, I think that people who are marginalized often feel as though power is you know, purely in representational terms, a lot of the work they were doing was very much kind of behind the scenes. Uh, they avoided um, sort of publicity. Uh, I was often told that it would be hard to get people to talk on the record because uh, they don't necessarily need the media as sort of conveyors of their message. So a lot of the folks that I talked to who are working around standardized testing, working on affirmative action, will just sort of directly go to the politician and say, we have you know like 500 foot soldiers if, if you need sort of campaign, campaign workers. Like we will just come to you and agree to do the work. We don't really need to route this through the Daily News, New York Times. We don't really need that mechanism, which I think has always been central to how social movements evolve and grow, is sort of name, name recognition, things like that. And I think it's a it was a really interesting and eye-opening thing for me to see that um, a lot of the organizers on the right didn't really follow the same methodologies as, as people sort of were, 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 were progressive. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just 
want to add that you know, totally agree with my colleagues, um, and, 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 and I think it's important not only to hold elected officials accountable and make the ask when they want to get into office, but once they're already in office, making sure to stay in their face, right? Uh, and, and you know, the Democrats, yes, they have a history of being more pro immigrant than, than Republicans uh, generally. Uh, however, you know, politics is politics, right? And we know that if we don't put our stories in front of elected officials, confront elected officials and, and, and hold them to their promises, we're, we're not gonna go anywhere. Um, there's a, a conference going on right now in, in Puerto Rico, the SOMOS conference, where uh, the governor's council <coughs> said in, in no uncertain terms that driver's licenses for the undocumented would be a priority for 2019. And we have to seize on those moments, right? And make sure that this is what you said, we need to hold you accountable to this. This is why it's important for our community members for you know for, for, for various reasons, uh, and and make sure to hold folks accountable even when they're in office because otherwise uh, there's lots of ways to get out of promises. I was wondering too, Simone, when you were talking about um, you know the importance of accountability um, and also speaking to the issues. If through that process you're also <coughs> educating um, you know your constituents about how government works too, right? Um, so that it goes beyond sort of just the exercise of political power, but more specifically, like what are sort of the mechanisms and, and how do they begin to think about where to target um, their energies and, um, and focus, I guess, that accountability? Yeah, well, you know, we have a whole staff member who's really focused all of their time on building the organizing and um, base building power of our community partners. Um, and we made that investment very clearly because for us it's so important to ensure that our communities not just know what the building blocks are to be able to build community power, electoral power, but that they're doing so in a smart way, right? So in Alabama, right, there is an incredible opportunity now that our community partners have seized on to build some real strong alliances um, with folks who are able to shift power on the issues around immigration enforcement, around community police relations and around racial profiling. Not just because um, that Senate seat flipped, but because there is a powerful opportunity to feel, build real collaboration across lines of ethnicity and immigration status um, in the community, right? So like racial profiling is you know, a core issue that deeply impacts, of course, all immigrant communities, but increasingly is disproportionately impacting in a deadly way, South Asians and black folks, right? So for us, I think it's really, critical to be able to seize upon those who are willing across our community partners to want to play ball, frankly, um, and build some ground game. Knowing and understanding that that work is gritty, right? Um, the folks that make the road know that so well, right? Um, but that that is gonna be, I think, um, what is gonna get us on the path to being taken seriously, not just in the city council, but by the police chief, right? By folks in the state legislature and on the way up, um, and I think, um, also making it clear that there's so many avenues towards an engagement, right? It's not just folks who are voting. God knows what's gonna happen with respect to denaturalization in this moment, right? Um, so I think being able to be really clear about the, there being multiple avenues of, of avenues of engagement to showcase community priorities, community power, and community accountability is critical. And I think that is certainly easily most lent to work at the ballot box but is part of a continuum that needs to start far beyond before that. And Theo, to ask, you talked about um, in your opening statement about how the emphasis for your organizing work sounds like it's really about sort of boots on the ground, direct <coughs> engagement, you know, sort of personal one-on-one -on -one conversations, right, and doing that door knocking. Um, I'm curious if that's your emphasis because you had used ethnic media or mainstream media um, and found sort of its limitations for being able to reach your membership or if that is still still is a part of your toolkit. Can you talk a little bit about no, that? No, it, it absolutely is. Not only you know traditional uh, <coughs> ethnic media, mainstream media, but also social media. Um, but while these are important tools to get our message out to stakeholders, elected officials, community members, uh, the issues we're working on, what we want, et cetera, there really is no proxy for <coughs> being in, 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 in someone's living room and talking to them about how they can get involved, right? Uh, you know, talking to them about, yeah, you might be being evicted uh, from, your, from your building right now, but this is a, a problem uh, for, for thousands and thousands of people across our state, across our country. Um, and really, 
trying to find that moment where we can shift someone from kind of thinking, well, this is just the situation that I have to accept, to what can I do uh, to, to, to change uh, what we're seeing, right? Um, and, and, and for us, it, you know, as a C3, um, doing uh, issue organizing, it, it, it often means how do I get involved and engaged in a group that is trying to pass, um, you know, housing uh, housing legislation that will make housing more affordable or prevent landlords from, from, being, from evicting um, tenants. Uh, but but also, you know, how do I um, uh, how do I you know use my power at the polls and how do I get the word out in my in my communities in my neighborhoods with my family members, my friends about the power of voting. Uh, and why we need to vote. Uh, so, so for us, uh, you know, it, it really is that that moment, right? That that shift really happens, and, and sometimes it doesn't happen on that first door knock. It really takes lots of persistence. It takes um, having community centers, trusted places where people can come uh, and do workshops, break bread with other people, um, and have conversations about strategy. Um, and, and the other other thing that I would say is that for us. It's super important to make sure that our, our work is not led by staff. Uh, often staff is crucial, right, to helping uh, develop leadership, but really we're, we're, we're gonna make lasting change if the, the, the leadership of our campaigns, of our work, of our organization um, is, by, uh, is done by the members, the community members that walk through our doors. Uh, and so we don't get someone from kind of the, you know, jaded, uh, you know, community member who maybe no change is possible to someone leading a campaign in the press, you know, being interviewed, sitting in front of a legislator uh, via traditional press. That's that's one of the tools, but really the, the, the strongest tool for us is uh, is the one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of face-to-face -face interaction. Stephen, did you want to add to that? Or I wonder, um, you know, with the New York Immigration Coalition also being a member organization, if you have um, insights into how you're seeing these strategies or others um, working yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, for so many of the work, for so much of the work that's out there, the door-to-door -door personal contact is absolutely critical. Um, and I think sometimes people assume that work gets done. It doesn't. You know, I remember back when I used to work at the Mint Fund Center, way back in the day, way back in the day, it was uh, 10, 15 years ago, you know, I remember when we first started doing door knocking for the first time around elections. And, I, and believe it or not, everybody was like, no, that's not gonna work. You, you know, Koreans don't like people coming to their door at like 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. knocking on their door. I was like, first of all, not that many people like that anyway. <laughs> but I don't see why Koreans in particular wouldn't like that. You probably never tried it with a Korean person speaking Korean. And we did it, and lo and behold, their people actually responded. They were like, wow, you're coming to me and talking to me you know, in my language and, and asking me about these kinds of issues that are important to me. It was eye-opening. And, you know, there used to be that kind of like mantra, like, oh, like, you no know, door knocking doesn't work with Koreans. And it was totally wrong. It was completely wrong. It was a false narrative. I, I don't think you hear that today. So I feel like we have to be cognizant that there's a lot of these kinds of like tropes out there that we should, that are, are really just an excuse for not investing in that kind of outreach. And I think particularly with the Asian American community, we need to do more of that. And we need to call people to account, to say, you need to invest in our communities, you need to invest in the capacity to do grassroots organizing and advocacy, because at the end of the day, there's other people investing in that, they're gonna use, they're gonna do that anyway, and, and they're gonna do so around issues that you don't really like. So I feel like, you know, that's one thing that's really critical. We see that imbalance, you know? I mean, to me, right now, the Chinese American community is the single, is probably the single largest immigrant community in New York City, hands down. And when I look at it from my perspective, and I see the fact that there's not a single Chinese based, a Chinese community based immigration legal services provider, that's not a shame. That's that's a tragedy, right? It means that all these Chinese immigrants are going to these fraudulent, you know, people are saying that you should apply for asylum everybody gets denied and they're they're in a really terrible situation so you know I just feel like overall we should not forget that there's a structural imbalance and that there's a lack of investment in the Asian American community in New York the second thing that I would say though is just as we need to invest in some of that real capacity to do sort of the on the ground work we also need to be cognizant of other tools right right now the Chinese Tea Party folks are utilizing Weibo and WeChat to incredible success 
you know, if you're gonna do stuff in the Korean community and you're not using Kakao Talk, it's not gonna be all that successful. I mean, we have to embrace and think about some of these new modes of organizing. So I think those are the two things that we need to do. We need to continue to pound the drum around investing in our communities, particularly at this sort of like grassroots level. And we also need to be flexible enough to think about how we're going to engage and use these new modes because if we don't, somebody else is gonna do it. To build on that, have you seen examples of using social media in those platforms effectively to counter some of the false information that's being disseminated and that's having, I think, an effective impact in organizing people um, and galvanizing a lot of that sort of right-wing sentiment around certain policies? Um, and I wonder if while I'm looking at you, if you have a perspective as a journalist about how, as grassroots organizers, we might think about using that based on your observation and experience? Sure. Um, there are, you know, it is true that the, the dominant narrative, and it, it is roughly true, is that um, the Chinese social media space is far more right-leaning than it is anything else. Um, and, and that is a true of the fact that it was a space that was long ignored, right, by organizing, by academics, by journalists, all sorts of folks. Um, there are a few people. There's this one account called Chinese American. There's this other account called the No Melon Group. They're, they're, they basically consist of people who enter into the fray and sort of argue with people on the right. I think the larger issue, though, and it's endemic to politics in general, is that the dream of any kind of politician, especially a demagogue, would be to turn everyone into a single issue voter. And, you know, immigrants tend to be single issue voters. Those issues tend to be like, discrimination or education, affirmative action, standardized testing is sort of this perfect storm. For the rest of the country, that single issue has just become like fear. And so uh, I think that makes it really difficult because when I talk to the more progressive WeChat folks, they're really trying to kind of plug holes in a dam, right? They, they, it's very difficult for them to conceptualize a single message to contradict like a sea of misinformation, right? Or a sea of, of of um, innuendo that organizes around this theme of fear, right? That you should be terrified of like, people around you. Um, I think I agree that I, that it requires the flexibility to engage in those spaces and to create to think about effective messaging suitable for that space, right? But also um, to do the face-to-face -face thing to talk to actually talk to people because I think when you actually talk to people and then. Um, one of the guys said this really beautiful thing about how the head of the Tea Party, like sort of Orange County Chinese Americans, and the head of the most progressive account, they're actually friends in real life, and they play on the same soccer team, and he was saying like, in real life, we actually have useful conversations. And so I think that kind of gave me a bit of hope, uh, just that they weren't, at least the guy, the liberal guy, wasn't giving up on the fact that he wanted to talk to people That's for both of you. Um, is really important of course. Um, because you know so many of API communities, right, come from communities that for ten thousand years have seen lines of class, race, and caste embraced, right, by the powers that be, whether they're colonizers or by people in positions of autocratic power, um, to um, to really monopolize um, divisions between communities, right, um, and so because let's say in AAPI communities, we don't have um, perhaps the same language that we all speak, or we don't have the same religion that we all speak, or we don't have the infrastructure that let's, let's say comes from worker organizing or liberation theology, the way that you see in Latino communities, right? We are building the organizing capacity and the idea that we can organize across lines of race, ethnicity, class, caste, color, um, um, from the ground up. Right, um, and that work is like blood, sweat, and tears, right? Um, and it is the one-on-ones, but it's also, I think, acknowledging the divisions that we come to the table with and then front fundamentally constructing an idea, an identity for ourselves in this country. 
um, which we found is critical, right? So like, yes, we want to organize and speak to uncles and aunties that are clinging, um, you know, from from their time in South Asia to anti-Muslim sentiment or to anti-immigrant sentiment or to speaking about illegals, right? But the real transformational opportunities come when they are able to come together with their children and speak with us about the future that we are all building together in this country. And that isn't just messaging, right? Like when we're talking about a future for our communities in this country, we're talking about, you know, saying no to immigration enforcement. We're saying yes to political engagement and accountability. There's any number of ways that we can drill down on all those issues, but I think being really honest, you know, not just with ourselves and our communities, but also with those who are supporting us or should be supporting us, but that work takes time, takes money, and takes a deep level of engagement. Uh, but that that's going to be the way that we're actually able to shift things. You know, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, right? I mean, the first two Muslim women elected to Congress, hallelujah, right? They got there because they were organizing in their communities. Rashida is the first Palestinian American woman, but her district, when she was in the Michigan State House, is predominantly Latino. Right, so she has actually showed us the way the transformational politics and organizing can work. Yeah, have the right kinds of influencers out there who are repeating that message and really thinking about the way to do that and, and really kind of creating that symbiosis with the ethnic media by which the ethnic media is being educated and promoting those same kinds of messages as well. And so there's a stark difference around the treatment of immigration in the Chinese media and the Korean media, and I think a lot of it is because of influencers. Also in Los Angeles, the Korean media, if you look at the Korean media there, it's very different. They're actually much more conservative around the issue of immigration, partly because I think the kinds of community influences that are out there are not seeing the right kinds of messages. So I absolutely think, particularly with some of these more linguistically isolated communities, the right influencers and community leadership is absolutely important. We've got to figure out how to, to co-opt that. Uh, there's a question back there. Um, so I'm more interested in the uh, politics 1.0 to 2.0 uh, conversation that was being had before. We've had some interesting election races in our area of Queens, and we've seen a lot of long-term incumbent folks like Peralta, Crowley, and people who've been in town for a while, but have also ignored the South Asian population of their district for a long time, out of office now, and new faces have come in. Um, looking at the actual election data, the election districts in which they did really well and were South Asian districts as well. And there was a lot of engagement from these new politicians who have come in into the South Asian community, but my fear is that's, that's where it's gonna stop. And that's gonna be it, and it's gonna be status quo, same as before. So my question is, what does that roadmap from politics 1.0 to politics 2.0 look like in your opinion? And how can we support each other, our own communities, and making sure that this is happening, that our communities are being engage and listen to. Well, Jeff Queen, I'm sure you're not going to let that happen. Try out. <laughs> I think some of it is also just being consistent, right? Like, you've got to be in people's faces all the time, right? Um, and so I think from, you know, organizations, knowing also that, you know, today's state senator is going to be, you know, um, an aspiring member of Congress in two to five years, right? Being able to kind of get in early and make sure that that level of sustained relationship and engagement um, is critical. Um, and I think also it's like up for the highest bidder, right? I mean, Joe Crowley made his political career by showing up for like India Day parades, right? Um, but he didn't actually at the end of the day sort of put his money where his mouth was when it came to door knocking, right? Um, and so while the South Asian American community may have played into some of that political donor culture, perhaps, when it came to folks like Crowley and Peralta. I think it's really important that those who are currently um, uh, sort of um, occupying those positions know that South Asians want to, you know, be able to meet with them on the issues from jump, right? Um, and sometimes that's like, you know, getting the cell phone number for their chief of staff and, you know, texting them at 11 o'clock at night, right? Um, but I think it's by by virtue of that sort of sustained level of engagement and making sure that you're always really clear with them about what the ask is, um, that you're watching, and that you're gonna circle back to them. Because I think it's that loop um, that is often most challenging. And I know it's so hard, right? Like no one has the time for that, particularly when it comes to community-based organizations. But I think being able to be really concrete that you have people behind you and that they care about the issues is what's most important. And I would say that I think that's right. I would say organize yourselves first. 
figure out what your paths are gonna be and then go and claim your power, right? For Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and for Jessica Ramos, you know, they're sort of basking in their victories now. I would go to them and, you know, claim your power and say, look, this is how many South Asians came out for you. These are the donors that we have connections to. I mean, ideally you have this conversation before you go out and you do that, um, but you know, I'd have a, a legitimate conversation, right? These are the issues that groups like Achaya are pushing, for example, around basement apartments. Will you, as state senator, sponsor a bill around that, right? Um, will you invest in the South Asian community, right? And so what does that look like, right? Is that discretionary funds? You know, will you have staff members or you know, a campaign force and are you committed to making sure that X percent of that campaign force is gonna reflect your community? I mean, it would mean putting those asks out there in an explicit fashion, ideally connecting up with people who are giving the money, because at the end of the day, electeds care about people and people power, and they care about money. So ideally, it's a way in which those two things are connected, and the ask goes to the elected official, and you have them on record committing to that, and so afterwards, you can go back to them and say, here are the promises that you made to us. We're here to make sure, we're here to collect on that, right? So I would say that's kind of what that roadmap might look like for some of those folks. I, I would just add that, um, you know, I think Albany is, is a very complex and interesting place, right? And, and a lot of our, we all, a lot of us know that. And what I think is an issue is that elected officials often think that our communities only really know the very basics, right? They know about the, the Democrats, Republicans, how to pass a law, et cetera. When we engaged our, our members around what is the IDC in New York State? Uh, you know, how, is, how have they played a role in passing or not passing a legislation that we care about? Uh, you know, what, what, if, you know what, what, what has been the dysfunction of, of Albany and how has that worked, right? That for us became another layer of engagement with our community members and really resulted in even more energy behind the issues. Because they knew, right, they could hold people accountable as to what they were doing in Albany. Um, and for us, you know, I think also just presence in Albany um, is huge, right? Um, when we're there with our members, we have plans to be there uh, basically every week, um, you know, in, 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 in the coming year, uh, to really make sure that our elected officials know that our members not only know who they are and what their names are and kind of what areas they represent, um, but really know about the political dynamics and, and, and know how to strategize in Albany and, and win with what our, na our neighborhoods need. Joanne, um, so I'm curious, you know, Asian Americans are at least 10% of the population in 26 council districts. That means that we have the potential to elect a whole lot of people who look like us to city council who are gonna be doing a lot of things that we ask them to do, right? I mean, there's an, a, a level of accountability, but there's a power that we have never realized because there's like, because people don't come out to vote, right? And I think that's a, that, that's a narrative that we, we, have to, we have to focus on and change. Um, we talked about, you guys talked a little bit about technology, and how, but I will tell you how important technology is because since yesterday, I've been on my phone with my Facebook group getting volunteers to count ballots for Stacey Abrams remotely, right? Like, people in California are counting her ballots for her. And so that's how we use technology to mobilize people because right now everybody's so fed up that we, they will do anything. Like, people are like, oh my God, I'll stay up all night to do this for her. And, you did this training, and they will send you a list that you're supposed to look up. People are like, I'm so disappointed they didn't, they didn't send me a list, right? So like, and then I'm getting an email saying like, this is a drill, we have to call people now. But there's a way to use technology to activate people. And I think we really need to understand and figure out how, to, how we have to play that to our advantage. But I have a question for Steve. Put him in a little hot seat. Presidential 2020. What are we looking at here, right? Because. I mean, I will tell you that I've been screaming at a lot of DNC folks to say like, who do we got, right? Like, are we putting somebody out there? Are we, war 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 how are we warming up the audience? Um, but there's a lot of people out there saying, unless we start to get it together, it's gonna look like Trump again, right? Yeah. So I wanna ask, you know, you've mobilized us on a lot of things, but what do we do in New York? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Well, 
I would just say really briefly that, and I know this might not be popular, but I think we have to prepare for a second Trump term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a history of 25 years of first term presidents winning their second term, no matter how unpopular they are. And we've been around for all of them, right? George W. Bush, who we thought was the worst president ever, <laughs> he won, right? You know, I, I think, so I just gotta be honest, like the recent history for the past 25 years is that incumbent presidents win. I just wanna, you know, put that out there, right? I, not to say that we can't have hope, you know, but that's there. Here's what I would say. I think it's completely clear to me that Governor Cuomo is gonna run, and that Senator Kristen Gillibrand, hey Nancy, um, Chris, Kristen Gillibrand is gonna run. So, I think it's an opportunity to work with both of them, right? Our voices are gonna be important, our people power is gonna be important, our money is gonna be important. I think we have an opportunity to have influence on the Governor Cuomo's, the Kristen Gillibrand's, and other folks, but I think particularly those two, because in my sort of opinion, I think that they're running. So let's figure out how to use that in a smart way. That's our opportunity that we have to face. Nancy, don't tell Kristen that. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to emphasize that I actually believe that it's beyond, it's, it's about transcending, you know, us just getting AAPI candidates, right? Like for me, it's about like, show me where, the, where your money and where the mouth is. Right? Like, if you're going to be good on our issues, I don't care if you're a Russian Republican, <laughs> right? Like, um, what's most important to, that I think is, is really about building the political sophistication in our communities is to make sure that people are committing for the right reasons to the right issues, because the issues are actually gonna, what are going to create opportunities for us to mobilize with other communities across all these different lines, right? So it's not just like, oh yeah, great, Kamala Harris is probably running too, right? Like, it's Kamala Harris, what are you gonna do about issues of detention in Victorville, California, right? What are you gonna do about, you know, the implications of adding a citizenship question to the census, right? And not just, you know, what are you gonna do beyond speaking to the media, right? It's about the votes that you're gonna cast, it's about the alliances that you're building, and it's about getting things done. And I think that's what's gonna be the critical moment for us to be far more prepared than we have been. We might have time for one more question. There's no one out there? I know it's late in the day, so um, I think that's a great way to end, Suman. I think what I've heard is that grassroots organizing takes resources, it takes significant capacity, um, it's required <coughs> consistency, um, and the focus should be on the issues, on holding our elected officials accountable, um, and that cross-racial organizing is possible. We're seeing the impact of that, and we really need to double down and continue to do more of that. Um, and that there's a real power in the use of technology. We're still finding our way through that, it sounds like, but it's one of um, many important social media challenge, um, channels for us to, I guess, develop more skills and be able to be utilized more effectively. I wanted to see, maybe give the opportunity for the panelists to see if they have any closing points you want to make before we wrap up. Um, with that, then I want to thank the panel um, for a great conversation, um, as well as all of you participating um, in the conference today. So thank you very much for coming. We will be sending out a survey next week where we will be asking about your interest in participating in some way, whether it's a series of conversations that will continue these discussions with other featured speakers um, or other forms of engagement that you'd like to participate in. Thank you, and good night.